My name is Kamal Erkin. I'm the chairman of American Surgery Center, and I have Dr. Isaiah Ergan with me, our president for CREAS. You know, bariatric surgery is an extremely important, extremely serious treatment of a very, very serious illness, which is uh, uh, morbid obesity. And uh, it is the most effective treatment that we currently have available for people who need to lose, you know, 80, 90, 100, 150, 180 pounds for them to be healthy. Uh, as you mentioned earlier on, the process that we have through our program at the American Surgery Center really is geared to optimize this process in a way that the safety is enhanced, but the experience itself is also very, very uh, good for the patient, right? Uh, anytime one thinks about surgery, not, they don't necessarily think about having a pleasant experience, right? It's a treatment, of course, if they could avoid that treatment, they would wish they could do so. But if they have to have that treatment, obviously, why not have it in a way that is really as pleasant as possible uh, for the patients? And so in our surgery center, First, let's talk about one of the issues that is mentioned time and time again by patients when they reach out to you, Kamal, to give you feedback on what their experience was like, right? So patients actually volunteer to write quite extensively about their experience, right? Now, imagine a person who has had surgery, right, to take time to write something about what their experience was. It takes a lot of uh, really comfort with what that has happened within the surgery center. And the key factor is that human touch, that human relationship, right? So everybody that is at our surgery center has one and one goal only, and that is to take care of that patient at that time, right? So that patient becomes the center of the universe for everybody at the surgery center. The staff that are going to be in the reception area, the nurses that are going to do the preoperative work, the nurses that are going to take the patient to the operating room, our anesthesia colleagues, the surgeons, of course, the physician assistant, the nurses in the recovery area, the nurses who will be discharging the patient, right? So that whole theme about being completely devoted and advocating for the patient, it shows, right? It shows in this type of uh, reviews that you are getting. So we're not getting a review about a patient who had a wonderful meal at a restaurant, come on, that's easy to write because it was, you know, it was a meal, right? They are writing about surgery, something that is not necessarily related with uh, pleasure, right? So that we have accomplished and uh, you and I should be extremely proud about that because it takes an extremely good team for that to be accomplished continuously throughout the whole process from the patient coming to our surgery center until they leave the surgery center. So that human touch, that approach, that person, patients feeling completely comfortable in the hands of the people taking care of them. I think we've been able to accomplish that through the culture that we have inside our surgery center. So that's one, that human touch, that relationship that we've been able to uh, 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 accommodate. Now, one thing that obviously has given us an advantage in order for us to be able to do that is that we are a surgery center. Come on, we are not a hospital. Right? A hospital, by definition, has to take care of many different problems for many different people. And the people within the hospital have to be able to wear different hats at different times, right? Well, we are a surgery center that focuses on a specific uh, issue, right? And that's where we are. So we don't have uh, 20, 30, 50 patients coming and going through the day, right? We have one bariatric patient at a time, and that patient becomes the center of attention of everyone. Absolutely. That not only, of course, is critical for the outcome in terms of the quality, but also that comfort level, that human touch that patients perceive immediately when they get into our surgery center. So that's very important. And then there is the other issue that we focus on a lot, come on, and that is we focus immediately on the recovery side of the surgery, right? Because that's important, right? The surgery itself is undertaken with the patient under general anesthesia. So they are completely unaware of all the work that the surgeon and the assistant and the nurses and anesthesia are doing. But what about when they come out of anesthesia? Our 
work is really geared to making that recovery faster and also as present as possible. And to be able to accomplish that, come on, we have a protocol that starts just before the surgery itself. In fact, most patients will come to the surgery center and they will be given some medications before the surgery that are uh, designed to minimize discomfort after the surgery. They are designed to minimize nausea after the surgery. These are medications that are not available in other places easily, particularly the anti-nausea medication that thanks to your efforts we were able to get in our surgery center from all is a medication that we simply cannot obtain in uh, the hospital. I mean, I have to be a cancer patient gaining chemotherapy to be able to get that medication for nausea come out in the hospitals. But at the surgery center, our patients get it. And guess what? Very, very little nausea after the surgery, right? So those medications right there, right? You know, not, not, only, not only it makes the recovery less painful, much faster, but also they don't have to stay overnight in the facility. Now, I think maybe the differentiating the surgery center from the hospital, I think what we also need to understand is, although we love our patients, we all also know that their home is the best place for their recovery and then make them feel better. So I think we are not motivated necessarily to uh, keep them longer. So sometimes staying longer may be more painful, right? So, and, and then that was one of the reasons that we wanted to make sure that we uh, provided whatever is necessary, even if the cost is higher for us. Uh, but that was absolutely. not our main motivation. Absolutely, absolutely. That's key. That's key, absolutely. There is no bed more comfortable than your own bed that you've been accustomed to, right? So when you're recovering from surgery, you want to be there. But we are able to send them to their bed comfortable, right? We don't want them to be requiring pain medication, strong pain medication every hour, every two hours, like what would happen in the hospital, right? Why? Well, because our preparation allows us to be able to uh, have them leave our surgery center in that state of comfort and very little, if any, nausea at all. Now, we've given them medication, as I said, even before any other, uh, any of the surgery started to prime them towards that uh, uh, situation. But then during surgery, there are certain things that we do differently as well that really enhance that uh, recovery by minimizing discomfort. Now, clearly, one of the discomforts that a person experiences as they are waking out from surgery is their incision site because there has been a cut in the skin, a cut in the muscle, a cut in the peritoneum, and that has been sutured back. But again, it's a site of trauma in our body has been designed to alert us about trauma anywhere in our body by making it painful so we can pay attention to it. Pain, however, is not pleasant, right? Pain also decreases the rate of recovery. In fact, if there is too much pain, the recovery rate is much slower, right? So there was a time in which we were thought that taking care of pain is important. Of course, we understood it, but we used to give so many strong medications for that come out. And the medications themselves became worse than the pain itself in terms of really slowing down the recovery of the person. We will use narcotics, strong narcotics, that would put the patient completely to sleep again. Yes, they wouldn't feel the pain, but they're not up and walking, they're not recovering. In addition, those medications will cloud their mind, so they, are not, they don't have clarity of the mind. Those medications will slow down the recovery of their digestive tract, so the medications became worse than the pain itself when it came to recovery. So we don't use any of those medications. What we use is something called a uh, top block, which is a very specific way of administering targeted numbing medicine into some nerves that supply the abdominal wall. We do this when the person is asleep, so they don't really notice us doing it. And yet when they wake up, they, were, they will have very little, if any, discomfort from the incisions themselves without any narcotic medication, right? So, it is really rewarding to see a patient walking, waking from anesthesia without any frowns on their forehead because they're comfortable. If you see the frowns, it means they are uncomfortable, right? And yet you see them waking up from the anesthesia, no frowns at all. And so we're able to transport them to the recovery room. What is peculiar about our recovery room, Kamal? And that, that is that patient who's recovering will have one nurse at their bedside. That nurse will be spending all the time with that patient, knowing them, 
taking care of them, right? Informing them, communicating with their family, communicating with us, the surgeons, communicating with anesthesia. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Of course, it's very difficult to accomplish that in a hospital setting because by definition, again, the hospital has so many patients that you cannot have one nurse for one patient. You have to have one nurse for many patients. And that, of course, doesn't mean the nurses don't take good care of them, but it is different from having one nurse taking care of one It's, it's the workload, right, Dr. Ghazal? So it's when you have, uh, when, you, when you are on a floor of uh, so many different rooms and you have to actually take care of so many people, then they sort exactly. of have a choice. But in the surgery center, the whole issue is and uh, our focus is bariatric. And, uh, and these patients do get the proper attention uh, because just, just think about from the process of getting them ready for the surgery, how long time we mm -hmm. spent and they spent and the frustration and the clearances. So then at the day off, they have the most anxiety. So uh, you and I, we do the daily case conferences with our team. And sometimes like we get frustrated on their behalf because the process is painful. Now, uh, I do wanna talk about our uh, new direction diet uh, prior to the surgery. And I have some specific questions uh, perhaps uh, that we can uh, address those. Now, most of our patients, they do two weeks uh, special diet yes. uh, prior to the surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this, is a, this is a meal replacement. Uh, so yes. uh, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, preparing their body in a way that once we are in there, we don't have any surprises. Uh, it's not just the weight loss, or it, or, and, and maybe it is. So uh, if you can kind of just address that, because I made a mistake the other day with, I assumed that I knew something and then I, I, I was wrong. So if you can actually address that for us, Dr. Rigal. Absolutely, Kamal. So what... We know is that when we become overweight, when we become obese, when we become morbidly obese, come on, one of the things that happen is a lot of fat tends to accumulate in the central portion of our body, which is our abdomen, right? And solid organs like the liver tend to have a lot of uh, fat as well, right? In fact, many people will know that their doctors will tell them, yes, you have a fatty liver, sometimes even more serious than a fatty liver, just specifically because of the weight. Now, for us surgeons, this is very, very important issue. And the reason is simple. And I'm going to use a diagram actually to demonstrate that, Kamal. I know you have slides, but do you think my diagram is visible, Kamal? Can you see it really clearly? Yes. So it's a diagram of the digestive tract. It shows the food pipe. It shows the stomach and shows the intestine. What we see here, Kamal, is the liver. Now, the artist has been very nice and shows a very small liver that hardly covers the stomach. Really, this is a representation that really doesn't reflect reality, particularly when we are obese. When we are obese, in reality, the liver is large and it covers almost most of the stomach, right? So in order for us to do the surgery on the stomach, when we divide it, for instance, for the sleep, we have to push away the liver and retract it so we have complete visibility. Mm -hmm. But think about it. If the liver is very heavy, laden with a lot of glycogen, a lot of fat, it's going to resist that attempt of us pushing it, right? It's also almost going to uh, behave like a piece of stone, essentially. So if we force it to push away, then we can injure it, right? And in some cases, come on, if we don't do something about it before surgery, we may not be able to do the surgery at all. In fact, I remember I had a couple of cases about 12, uh, 13 years ago of patients who did not go on this diet, come out that I got in, but I could not finish the surgery because I could not see the stomach and I could not safely push the liver away. So what we do before surgery is we put people on this special diet called the new direction diet, which as you mentioned correctly, it's a meal replacement diet, which means that you cannot eat anything but that. It is complete in its nutritional content. It has all the vitamins, it has enough protein, but it is low calorie. And it's actually designed to be very filling. That's actually a good, good picture of a fatty liver, come on, right? So what it does specifically is when people are placed on that diet for a couple of weeks, yes, they lose weight, but a lot of the weight is lost from the visceral fat, which means the liver becomes 
nice, soft, and thinner. So when we push it up for us to expose the stomach canal, it follows us easily. No problem at all. So we are able to retract the liver and complete the surgery easily. So when we ask our patients really to go on this diet, yes, we know it's a tough diet sometimes, right? Because you're not eating anything else. And you and I have done that diet many years ago. Come on, you remember, right? The first two days are the hardest. But after that, it actually becomes easy, particularly if you drink plenty of water as you're doing that. You have to stay very well hydrated. It, you don't feel too much hunger because it's filling, but it helps us. Absolutely. It helps us greatly because the liver is shrunk and the surgery can be done safely. As you know, sometimes we ask certain patients to go actually on a three-week uh, new direction diet rather than two week. And that would apply, for instance, in situations where the body is really at such high levels, particularly in men, where we tend to accumulate most of our fat definitely in our waist, right? So we ask patients sometimes to be even on three week diet. And it's obviously uh, something that is demanding on them, but with good education, the vast majority of our patients are completely compliant. In fact, you know, interesting, when I see them in the pre-op area just before the surgery, the first thing I, I ask my patients is, hey, how was the diet? And many of them will say, oh, I did it. I did <laughs> it. Over. And I say, thank you. Very often they will tell me they've also lost 12 pounds, 15 pounds, 18 pounds. That gives me an idea of how much the liver has shrunk. And the first thing I do as soon as I enter the abdomen Kamal, is to inspect the liver, right? We look at the liver and see how uh, well it has done. And with this diet, invariably, we will see that the liver is nice and small. We can push it away easily and then we can perform the surgery safely.